last week you know we had a short we had a we had a break from our prophecy studies because brother mark was sharing his own perspective on predestination and the rest of it so we had a break but we're going to continue to speak by just dropping right back into the sequence that we have been following we have been going through the book of revelation and the last time we were looking at the last few verses of revelation 17. so to do some kind of brief uh, revision what we saw is that in in revelation 17 john is told that he is to be shown the judgment of the great whore who sits upon many waters and what we saw is that john has been god showed him first of all some background information about this woman this great prostitute and um it's in chapter 18 we're about to start chapter 18 and it's a part of the same prophecy part of the same sequence because in in revelation 17 john does not really see the judgment of the woman what he sees is a description of the woman and her alliance with the beast and a great deal of of the chapter is spent looking at the beast and giving us some details about the beast and we have to believe that somehow these details about the beast are somewhat related to the woman because the subject of this passage is the woman and the judgment of the woman that is what john is told come i will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters that's what he's told then he sees a woman sitting on the beast and the angel says i'll tell you the secret of the woman the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her then he goes into some detail about the beast which we are very grateful for because these verses that talk about the beast the seven heads that five have fallen one is one is not yet come all of this gives us some critical information what i really appreciate about revelation 17 is that there are some details there that are not given in the other prophetic passages in the bible what 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 people have traditionally done is that they have looked at daniel 7 revelation chapter 13 and they have tried to fit revelation 17 into that space so daniel 7 talks about the fourth beast and the little horn that came up among the other, the other 10. revelation 13 talks about the beast that came up out of the sea and uh, he had seven heads and ten horns and then revelation 17 what people automatically do is they take Revelation uh, 7, 13 and Daniel 7 and they try to fit Revelation 17 into that picture. But I think that Revelation 17 gives us details that we don't see in Daniel and we don't see in Revelation 13. There are details there that help us to get a more complete picture of what is happening. And that is why Revelation 17 is so important. Um, one of the things that I mentioned before that I will just re reinforce is that it's clear when you look at this picture that if you conclude that this woman has anything to do with the Roman Catholic Church, if you conclude that this woman has anything to do with the Roman Catholic Church, it means that you have to eliminate the beast from that picture. Why? Because later on in the chapter, in chapter 17, the, the ten horns, which are a part of the beast, they hate the woman, they make her naked, they eat her flesh, and they burn her with fire. In fact, I think the judgment of the woman is carried out by the, the, these, these ten horns. I think the judgment of the woman is carried out by these ten horns. So clearly, the woman cannot be be involved with the catholic church and the beast be a part of the catholic system and then half of the system turns against the other half of the system and devastates it i don't think that makes logical sense you know we can't say the vatican turns against the catholic church or the catholic church turns against the vatican and destroys one destroys the other that doesn't make sense because they are both two sides of the same coin so that is why one of the things that I have come to believe very strongly is that the beast cannot be 
the Roman Catholic Church, nor can it be the papacy. Because the ten horns are a part of the beast system at the end, and they are the ones that attack the woman, the woman and devastate her. Okay, so that's 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 some important details that we get in um, Revelation 17 that we don't see elsewhere. We don't see that in Daniel for sure. Neither is it made very clear in Revelation 13. So 17 is very important. So you come down to the end of the chapter and we have this information. And we are told that the the woman, let me let me go to the Bible so we're not just speaking in a vacuum. I know it's better when we are looking at verses together. So um I need to close this as always it constantly gets in the way. All right. So the last verse of Revelation 17. I know we had a little difference of opinion on this because um Brother Frederick he believes that this woman here is actually a city, and I think he believes that this this city is a city of Rome. There are several uh, reasons I suggested why I, I don't agree with that. But anyway, it says that, give me a second. The woman, he says, is that great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So whoever this woman is, it's important because we're about to look at what happens in the next chapter. We're about to look at the judgment of this woman. So the question is, is this the judgment of a particular city, a physical city? Or is this the judgment of a particular religious institution? So it's important that we understand what is this city. And I, I know that there are reasons on both sides. There's reasons that can be presented to suggest it's a physical place. But there are also reasons to believe it's not a physical place, but a spiritual entity. And when we go to the next chapter, we can look at some, some more of these evidences. But anyway, so this last verse here is a clue that God is giving us to help us to identify who this woman is. Um, so we're going to go directly directly to um, Revelation 18, and we see how, what happens next. And remember that what we are what we are looking at is the judgment of the great whore. This is not a different vision we are looking at. It's a it's a continuation of the same vision, the same same statement. Because the the purpose of this part of the vision is that John is to see the judgment of the great whore. That is the judgment of Babylon. And when you look at chapter 17, there's no judgment of Babylon. There's no judgment. So you have to look in chapter 18 here to see the judgment. All right. So it says, and after these things, this is after he has seen the angel come and explain about the beast and telling him about the ten horns and what will happen. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. We're mostly familiar with what is being said here, but but I want us to 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 to, to still examine the elements of this verse a little more closely. Um, he says, "I saw another angel, another, as opposed to who? Well, he has been seeing angels right from the beginning of this vision. One 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 set of angels that he saw was the three angels that he saw in Revelation 14. Three angels flying through the midst of heaven." Again, in, in chapter 17, one of the angels that had the seven last plagues came to him and said, let me show you the judgment. So when he says, I saw another angel, he means, in addition to all the angels that I've been seeing already, I see still another angel. So an angel comes down from heaven, and this one has great power. And the earth is lightened with his glory. Remember again, we are looking at a vision, and in the vision, Physical things, visible things, are being used to represent invisible things or, 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 or spiritual things. All right? So, we established when we were looking at chapter 14 that an angel 
when you see an angel in Revelation in this prophecy, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't necessarily mean a literal angel. The word angel means a messenger. And Revelation uses angels to represent messages that come from heaven. Events and messages that are sent from God are represented as an angel. For example, in Revelation chapter 10, you saw an angel come down from heaven uh, clothed with a rainbow. And he had one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea. And he has a little book in his hand open. And what we saw is that this represented that a message would come from heaven based on a little book. And this little book was the book of Daniel. We saw that clearly. And so a message was to come out of this book of Daniel that was to go to the whole earth, sea and land. So it's represented as an angel. So when we see another angel here come down from heaven, what we are looking at is another heavenly message. Not a literal angel. Not a literal individual person, but it's a message. So a message comes from heaven, and this message is accompanied by great power. One of the things we have been emphasizing, Brother Howard has been especially focused on it, is the, is the issue of the power that should accompany God's people. And what is true is that we have not yet seen that power in the way that we would like to see it in our generation. Yeah. But here we are told that the earth, that this angel, this message, when this message comes, it is accompanied by great power. Now, somebody may ask the question, where does this power come from? Because God already gave us, God already gave power to his church at Pentecost. Are we to expect any further power after Pentecost? Well, if you think, if you if, if you remember, we have, we have looked at the the festivals of Israel, the feasts of Israel, and what we have seen is that every one of those feasts represent some great work of Christ. Passover, wave sheaf, unleavened bread, Pentecost, and we have the three last day feasts: the blowing of trumpets, the day of atonement, and the feast of tabernacles. So the question is, do these last three festivals represent additional work that Christ does for his people? Absolutely. They can represent nothing else. Every single one of those seven feasts of Israel represented some great work of Jesus Christ for the salvation of humanity. Four of these great events have gone. That's one of the things I, I, I'm very strong about because many, many Christians believe that everything finished at, at, at Calvary. And some of them really even creep forward to Pentecost, but they don't go any further. They completely ignore the last three feasts. And that is unreasonable and illogical. How can you say four of the feasts have, have meaning and they were fulfilled in the time of Christ and the other three are irrelevant? You just, what, you just kind of snap your fingers and they disappear? In fact, many of these Christians say that the Day of Atonement took place when Jesus died. And this is unreasonable because it is clear as you look at these feasts of Israel that they represented the work of Christ on a timeline. Important. Not just seven things that Christ would do for the human race, but seven things that Christ would do on a timeline in a sequential, in a sequential form. So you can't say, for example, that Pentecost took place when Jesus died. That would be ridiculous. Everybody knows Pentecost took place 50 days later in a time sequence, just like God gave it to the Jews. There was a time sequence that started with the first month of the year in the month Abib on the 14th day of the month was the Passover. And it continued right up until the 15th day of the seventh month. When you had the Feast of Tabernacles in between, you have these seven feasts and they represent Seven great events in the history of salvation, very important and woefully misunderstood and misrepresented by many Christians. So they, they have no, they, they pay no attention to the last three festivals, which are very clearly, if you read the Bible and you have any kind of understanding in reading the Bible, it's clear 
that these three festivals have to do with the work of Christ. But you see, they, 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 the New Testament emphasizes something. It, it emphasizes the finished work of Christ. And because of it says the finished work of Christ, they insist that everything is finished. But the Bible does not support this. When Jesus died, he said it is done. So something was finished. But I'll show you in Revelation 11. Look at Revelation 11, which is which is future. And I don't know if they, they want to put this in, 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 in the past as well. It says, um, not exactly the words I'm looking for, but if you look at verse 15, Revelation 11, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The kingdom of God was set up at Pentecost. But here it says that there's another level to this because at this time, the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. If you look at Revelation 16, I think that's the one I was looking for. And the last... Right, in, in verse 17, it's talking about the seven last plagues. And it says... And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. I thought it was already finished when Jesus died at Calvary because Jesus said, it is done, it is finished. No. The work of Jesus on earth was finished, so it was finished. But the work of Jesus for mankind is not finished because if it was, we would have been in heaven long ago but we're still here because god is still accomplishing his work for the human race and jesus christ is still very much a part of that work so the remaining feasts the blowing of trumpets the day of atonement and the the, the feast of tabernacles those are still aspects of the work of christ that are still in the future now according to the belief of the seventh day adventist church the seventh day adventist movement the Day of Atonement began in 1844, and the blowing of trumpets began in 1833. I mean, Adventists see everything through historical, from a historical point of view. My, my, my understanding is a little different because I don't think, I really don't think the Day of Atonement started in 1844. And I have very good, very good reason for thinking like this. First of all, the Day of Atonement was an event that lasted for one day, just like Pentecost, just like the Passover, one day. 1844 until today has been not one day, not one year. It has been about 100 and near 170 years, 170 something years. Supposedly, we have been in the Day of Atonement in 177 years. And on the Day of Atonement, God's people were cleansed from all their sins. It was taken away. If this started from 1844, then every Christian who lived since then should have been completely without sin. Certain things should have happened within that. I mean, the second thing is that there's also the teaching. Adventists teach that the blowing of trumpets started with the preaching of William Miller in 1833 and it continued till 1843 10 years because in this interpretation they gave one day for one year if the blowing of trumpets was was to be interpreted one day for one year then the day of atonement which was immediately at the end of the blowing of trumpets it should also be one day for one year so the day of atonement should have lasted for one year not 170 something years I think you can understand what I'm saying. I hope so. So anyway, so the point is that the Day of Atonement, I don't believe it started in 1844. I think Adventists got the idea right that we are, we are, we are to see these end time feasts in our day. They were right. But some of their timing, they got wrong. So in it, it, what I understand is that when the blowing of trumpets is to be an event that takes place on this earth where the entire planet is to be awakened to be prepared for the Day of Atonement. 
the entire planet. And when this happens, God's people are to be are to be specially endued with power to give this blowing of trumpets or this loud cry. There's to be a, 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 a strong message that goes out, a message from heaven that goes out. Just like 10 days before the Day of Atonement, the Israel was prepared by the blowing of trumpets. God's people are to be prepared by a strong message accompanied with power. And, and, and at this time, the, there is to be this great message, this great outcry. So, so when it says here that in Revelation, 70, uh, Revelation 18, that when this angel comes down from heaven, the earth is light. He has great power. He has great power. I'm suggesting that this power here may be even more than just simply God's people finally believe. God's people finally believe and they take hold of his power. But I think there's more to it here also. I think this is, a, this is the power that comes from heaven because it is a, it is, it is a blowing of trumpets. It says that the earth was lightened with his glory. And what do we mean here? This, this is similar to what you read in Isaiah chapter 60. Let me go quickly to Isaiah 60 and look at something that is said here. Because Isaiah, though it's an Old Testament book, though several of these, um, several of these prophecies are in books of the Old Testament, the prophecies are real and they are true. But what we have to do is apply them in, in the context of the new covenant. Look at Isaiah 60 and see what it says. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness will cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. This, this prophecy, I grant you, it had a fulfillment in the coming of Jesus Christ. But um, you can read it carefully and you can, see, you can see that like many of these Old Testament prophecies, they have more than one application. It applied to the time of Christ, but it is clear it also applies to this time at the end of time when the earth is to be lightened with his glory. It says the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. So we have this angel coming down and the earth is filled with his glory. Now, what is the power of his message? What is the, 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 key, the key focus of his message? Look at what it says in verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. This is not a, 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 a puny message. This is not somebody going on YouTube and turning out one or two little videos. This is not somebody standing up in the pulpit and mildly protesting. This is a message that has power. And I don't know. I think it for, for, for a message to have great power, there has to be the pouring out of the Spirit of God in a special way. There have to be miracles. I don't, I don't see that any voice by itself can ever have an impact on this godless, stubborn world. I think, I think there needs to be the power of miracles accompanying the message. So it's not just, it's not just that the message is very clear. And that God's people are mightily committed. I think we also have miracles accompanying the message. Great miracles that compel the world to pay attention. Because it says it is a, it's, it's the earth that was lightened with his glory. So, he cries mightily with a strong voice. And what is his message? He's saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Now, we, we have seen this message before. In chapter 14, when we look at the three angels' messages, the second message spoke about the fall of Babylon. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. But this, 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 this statement is more detailed. Because what it says is that it is, be, it is become the habitation of devils. It has become the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So, We have to ask a question. This, this again, is, is another verse that makes me ask a question. Are we speaking about a literal city or something else? Whatever this city is, look at, look at what has happened. It has become a place where devils are living. 
a place where dirty, unclean spirits exist, a place where birds, and I'm, of course, this has to be spirit, this has to be figurative, right? Not literal birds. It doesn't mean that vultures take set in a physical city. It means that the the elements that that you would see in 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 a, in a broken down, deserted place where where ghosts and evil spirits live. It's kind of a, it's kind of a picture that you are getting of a haunted house, of a haunted city. You know, abandoned by people and left alone. And here are the spirits of evil devils and 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 everything. You know, birds have come and taken up their roost there bats and, and 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 all kinds of vultures and so on they have taken up their nest there it's similar to the, the description of what happened to ancient babylon after it was overthrown so we're asking the question are we looking at a physical city now tell me which physical city in the world could we say of that it has become a place where demons possess it and 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 vultures live and foul spirits exist if you say it's it's the city of Rome or it's the Vatican, then we're going to see some other 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 descriptions of the city that we say cannot apply to those two. All right. This is why I, I Excuse me, Brother David. Yes, Brother Mark. Sounds like it's the apostate church. It it seems very much that way to me. It seems very much that way to me that we are talking about a, a spiritual entity not a physical city, you know, because it, every city in the world today, some more so than others, I don't know if you could think of any particular city that is a center of spiritualism, any literal city, but I know that whether it's New York or London or Paris or, or Hamburg or Berlin or Rome and, and many other places, you can't think of any city in the world that is not possessed by people who are into spiritualism. I mean, I, I would I would almost want to say that you'd have to turn to uh, San Francisco, to the, the cities of California, if you want to find real new age uh, evil and, and, and spiritualism, you might have to turn to the cities of California. Those are some of the centers, San Francisco and those places. There, 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 there is a center of that kind of worship where you even have the Church of Satan established in, I think it was San Francisco. So, so if you're looking for a literal place, it's hard for me to, to say that we would pick on one city, one physical city above, above another. But God is talking about something that has reached a place of degradation. God says it is now fallen. And when he says fallen, it is clear that he does not mean it is destroyed. Boy. Boy. He doesn't mean it is destroyed because it's about to be destroyed, but it's not destroyed yet. And God says it is fallen. So what we're talking about is a, is, a, is a state of spiritual fall. It's a spiritual fall. And you say, what does it mean then? It means that this entity that we're talking about once was not fallen. Certainly once was not fallen to this condition. This entity was once not fallen, but now it has fallen. And it is repeated, is fallen, is fallen. And, and the depth of this fall is described when it says that it has become the place of devils and, the, and foul spirits and unclean birds. So we are speaking about a spiritual fall. And again, I would say, was this ever true that the city of Rome was ever, was ever spiritually upright? Was it ever true of New York or San Francisco or London or France or any of these cities? There were never places. Of spiritual of any spiritual height but but Babylon if it's a if it's a religious entity we are looking at we can say that once upon a time once upon a time Babylon was uh, the, 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 was supposedly Christian supposedly had some spiritual elements in it but it went progressively lower until by the time you come to this prophecy it is demon possessed. It is being led by demons. As you know, I'm not political, but I'll tell you something. If those of you who saw some of these people who were prophesying about um, Donald Trump, if you watch the video, I don't know some of these names, but I know some of them. I saw 
Paula White and I saw Kenneth Copeland and the behavior I saw from these people. My goodness, that was not Christian. They, they, they were possessed by some kind of spirit, but it was not the spirit of God. And the, 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 these are the, the components of Babylon. A, a system that should have belonged to God that went into harlotry. That's the, that's the other thing. Babylon is a harlot. What is a harlot? A harlot is a woman who sells her favors to, uh, to men. If Babylon is a physical city, then if Babylon fraternizes with other political powers, there's nothing wrong with that because they're of the same kind and they belong in the same place. Harlotry means, prostitution means when you belong to a certain husband and you sell your wares to other people. And again, this has very strong religious implications, suggesting that Babylon is a religious power, a religious entity. Now, it says, so Babylon is falling. And that's not the, that's the, the main point of this. We're going to come to in a few ver in another couple of verses. And it tells you again what we, we look at this in detail in chapter 17. But it says, all nations have drunk. So, so the influence of Babylon reaches every nation. Whatever you say Babylon is, <clears throat> her influence has affected all nations. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And, and as, as, as we pointed out, this fornication, this alliance with the, the powers of the world, notice who she has committed fornication with. The kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, these are the ones that she has fornicated with. Again, you have to think that this is a spiritual entity. You have to think that we're talking about some kind of religious power that does not have the right. As a matter of fact, you know, you know, in um, in James, in the book of James, it gives you a very clear commentary on what spiritual adultery is. It says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James clearly suggests that spiritual adultery is when you who are, are Christian, you become involved, you become intimate, you become tied up with the world. So anyway, it says the fornication of this Babylon has resulted in a wine that have made the nations drunk. And we commented on this already. Now, here it says in verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven. So another voice comes from heaven, not from the same angel. So what it means is that there is an additional element to this message. The first message is a, is a, is a statement that says Babylon is falling. Why do we need to tell the world that Babylon is falling? Why do we need to tell people that Babylon is falling? Okay, what are we going to say? Let us suggest, for example, that, they, that Babylon is New York. Let's just suggest that, right? Which you know is not what I believe. But let's suggest that, well, well, okay, let's say Babylon is the Vatican or it's Rome. So we say to everybody, look, the city of Rome has fallen. Or the Vatican has fallen. What, meaning what? What, do, what are we saying to them? We are saying that the Vatican has become more evil. Is that our message? Are we saying that Rome, if we say it's the city of Rome, are we saying that the city of Rome has become more evil? It's full of spiritualism. I will tell you, if you if you try to give this message to anybody, they will say, so what? Every city in the world is full of spiritualism. There's nothing extraordinary or unusual about a city being filled with spiritualism or full of spiritualistic elements because every city in the world is in the same condition. That's not, that's not really a message. Secondly, in verse 4, this voice from heaven says, come out of her, my people that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. If, if this is a physical city, we have a message only for the Vatican or for the city of Rome. You don't have a message for anybody else. If this is a physical city, we need to go down to the Vatican or we need to go down to Rome and give this message, come out of her, my people. Come out of the city of Rome. As a matter of fact, I don't know how many people God has living in Rome. There may be a few, right? There may be a few non-catholic christians and even a few catholic christians living there 
Uh, as for the Vatican, if, if we say it's the Vatican, I, I don't know how many Christians live in the Vatican really. I would I would believe that most of God's people have long ago chosen not to live there. But then the message in Revelation here is to the people who are in Babylon, nobody else. So if 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 we conclude that Babylon here is a physical city, then our duty is to go to that particular city and preach to the people in that particular city, and it's not a message for the world. I'm just making that point because in the context of Revelation, you can decide whether you think this message is just for one particular city or it is for the world. If you know, as a matter of fact, if you notice something, the angel comes down from heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory. It's a global message. It's not just a message for one particular location or one particular city. Another reason why it is clear to me that we're not talking about a particular city. So the earth is lightened with his glory and he cries with a loud voice and he tells you about Babylon. He's not, he's not attacking one particular location. He, it's a global message. And so he says, come out of her, my people. We can reasonably conclude that the people in Babylon exist all over the world. Therefore, 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 there is a global message. And the message is applicable to God's people all over the world. What are they supposed to come out of? They're supposed to come out of Babylon. Where are they? In a particular city or in a particular religious situation? Now, if we say we're talking about religious institutions then it then we do have a global message we do have a universal message because every place you go on this planet you will find god's people locked up in false religious systems with false religious ideas everywhere you go and even those who have some of their religious ideas right even those there are other elements of babylonian deception like for example if you if you talk about um whether it's the adventist church or the apostolic church or whatever church you want to talk about some of whom might have some elements of light the same babylonian principle of denominationalism and enclosing people enclosing their minds and ideas in 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 the idea that they need to be sub subjected to a, a, an earthly institution. They need to be subjected to an earthly institution. This is one of the main elements of Babylon. It's the, it's the tool that Babylon uses to close people's minds, to shut their minds to, 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 to any further truth. It's what Satan uses to lock people into darkness. And you all know very well what I mean. All of us have escaped from it, but few people escape. Last night we were listening to a testimony from um, Brother Elliot in, 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 in South Africa and you know he was telling us that um, one brother that he tried to share some, some truth with the brother said, brother, the Adventist church has theologians, so many of them, so many teachers. There's no chance that anything we teach is wrong. Because the first thing you learn in Adventism, the first thing you learn are, 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 I would say, the most significant message you get in Adventism. And I believe in, in, in most churches, the most significant thing you get is that this is God's church. This church is directed from heaven. Nothing we do is wrong. Nothing we teach is wrong. This is, this is one of the key elements of Babylon. So this message that comes to Babylon says God's people are to come out of Babylon. And like I say, if this message does not apply to these false religious, religious systems, then people might be justified in staying there. They might be justified in, rem in remaining there because so many people say, I can stay here. I don't have to be a partaker. I don't have to be involved in what they teach. But what I see here and what we can see here is there is a point in time when Babylon, whatever she is, Babylon reaches such a stage something visible and clear she reaches such a stage that god's people absolutely must divorce themselves from her get out of her or 
they face the prospect of being lost. Not that God closes their probation, but that they themselves make a choice that separate themselves from God. Now, again, I want to ask a question. What is this? Okay. What is this event? What event could take place in a literal city? Let's, let's, let's continue with that, that, that theorizing. I'm going to get off that in just a moment, but I want to make the point because I've given some consideration to this question because it's, it's, it's a real question because some evidence is presented that Babylon is a real city. And I would say some good evidence. I also see evidence that Babylon is not a, a literal city. It's a religious institution. Good evidence. So how do we determine wh where the truth is? And I, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at my reasons for believing it's a religious institution. Now, something happens as a turning point. This turning point is that Babylon suffers a great fall, a great moral fall. Something happens that is so evidently a fall in moral status, a fall from any connection with God, that finally God's people must get out of Babylon. Finally, there might have been reason before this for people to be associated with Babylon and it wasn't so bad, but something happens that makes it clear you can't be in that association anymore. Now, if we're talking about a city, which city? Rome? All right, let's say the city of Rome, for example. At what point has it been acceptable for God's people to live in physical Rome? I suppose you could say at any stage of history, God's people have lived in physical Rome, okay? God's people were there thrown to the wild beasts at one point in time, but they've lived there like they've lived everywhere else in the world. In my opinion, living in a place like some of some of the cities of, of California, what I hear about them, I've never lived there, but what I hear about them, some of these places are, are full of evil influences, maybe even worse than you might find in the literal city of Rome, but be that as it may. Something is to happen that is so degraded. There's such a fall to take place that God's people are told, get out of Babylon. As I said, if Babylon is a city, this message applies only to one city. God's people are, are welcome to stay anywhere else. They are welcome to be in San Francisco. They are welcome to be in New York. They are welcome to be in London, any place else. They must only get out of this one city because this one city has fallen to such a degree. And yet, the message is a global message. It's for the entire world. It makes far more sense to me that what we are seeing is something happening in the religious institutions, something that is happening that says to God's poor, misguided people who have put their trust in these systems, something happens to make them know, no, no, this is going too far. This is beyond reason. I have to get out of this. My opinion? It's just an opinion, okay? My opinion is that the churches are going to accept the, the homosexual movement. They are going to accept the LGBT movement. That's my opinion, and I could be wrong, okay? I'll tell you straight out, I could be wrong because I'm not a prophet. This is my, when I look around and I think about it, this is what I believe is going to happen. And it's partly based on the developments I see taking place, plus, the elements of, uh, that I see in the prophecy, as we have discussed, Revelation 14 and the third angel's message, you know where I stand and where, where this is coming from. But the thing is, something is to happen that says to the world, that says to Christians, these churches have gone past the bounds of reason. It cannot be Sunday worship because Sunday worship has been in these churches for over a thousand years. Which of them do you know that 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 is not, which is not doing uh, involved in Sunday worship? Maybe the Adventist Church and the Seventh Day Church of God and the Seventh Day Baptist. A few little churches they don't keep Sunday, but all the Christian churches you can't go to them and say Babylon is fallen because you keep Sunday. That's not a new message. That is a message over a thousand years old. What has to happen is that something. The, the churches have to accept something that is blatantly, brazenly, barefacedly 
in opposition to the principles of God, blatantly, brazenly, barefacedly, openly, that even the blind can see. So that when somebody chooses to remain in light of that thing, it's as clear as day that they have chosen to defy God. I believe that the churches are going to accept it. I believe so. I believe it is going to reach the place where the churches are going to accept it. They will accept it or they will cease to exist. And when they accept it, even the little blind loyalists who have, have set their hearts on believing this is God's church and it can't be wrong, even they. You know, the, the truth about God has taken many of us out of the Adventist church system. And I think it is even taking Christians out of other systems as well. But it's a strong movement and it's a strong message, but it is not strong enough yet. Because there are many Christians who are still confused on the issue of the Trinity. But I'll tell you what, there is no, there is no honest Christian. There's no honest Christian. I use the word honest because there are, there are a lot of dishonest people. There's no honest Christian who is confused about God's attitude towards homosexual behavior. We sympathize with the people who are struggling. We sympathize, like I sympathize with the thief, like I sympathize with the rat that I mentioned this morning. You sympathize, but you know that you don't condone it. You can't put up with it. God understands the dangers of it, and so God condemned it. And you can say, I sympathize with you, and I understand that you are struggling, but I cannot accept it. I cannot accept that my God accepts this kind of behavior. He will help you to get over it, but he doesn't accept it because this is clearly expressed in his word. When the churches come out and accept something that is so clearly opposed by the word of God, Paul says that those who practice it shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How can a Christian, how can any Bible-believing person or group so fly in the face of all the biblical evidence to say it's acceptable? You prove who your master is. You prove that you have rejected the counsel of God. And I believe this will be the decisive factor that will, will, will mark the fall of Babylon. I believe so. Like I say, I'm not a prophet and I could be wrong, but I do believe, I certainly believe that it is worth careful examination and careful thought. If it's not the the gay movement, it's something of that order, something that is so clear that you have no reasonable excuse, no reasonable excuse. I, I always knew, I always knew that something would happen that would be as clear as night and day, and that those who claim to be God's people, many of them would accept the night instead of the day. But it was hard to me to imagine what, because, you know, even the worst of Christians, the worst of professing Christians, they try to conform. They try, they, they, they might compromise in little ways, you know, like they, they, they might cheat a little bit, or, but, but they don't openly and blatantly come out and, and, and defy something that is plain as day that it is wrong. Even when you talk about Sunday worship versus Sabbath worship, they can find a few little verses that say, the disciples met on the first day of the week and they can find some verses to say, um, you know, on the first day of the week, you are to gather up um, whatever. They find some little excuse and, and it's a tradition that is deeply rooted and many of them are genuinely confused. Many Christians are genuinely confused as to whether or not it, it, it's wrong to reject the Sabbath. Many of them are. But as I said, which Christian, which reasonable Christian genuinely believes it is that God accepts homosexual behavior? <clears throat> Notice what I said. I didn't say homosexuals because there are people who I understand have a tendency. I can't control my inward thoughts and feelings. I can't control them. So I could not condemn somebody for having those. But what I can do by God's grace is I can subdue them. I can subdue them. I don't have to give in to them. My desires for outrageous behavior, I don't give in to them because God is in charge of my life and God gives me strength and I can live 
above those those desires when you tell me that you have these desires and you 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 have no intention by god's grace to give in to these desires i i will i will accept you as my brother and sister i will embrace you and i will fight with you i will fight with you when you tell me that god must accept you and accept your behavior not just the fact that you have certain tendencies but you are going to indulge those tendencies and god must accept you like this you have set out to the, in defiance of god that's what i'm saying and this is what i believe i, I hear you, brother Matt. just a second this is what i believe will happen in the churches and is, has already happened in several of these denominations go ahead brother Matt. i'm not condoning it um, but what makes homosexuality worse than any other sin like that can be more easily hidden uh, and kept private possibly Do you understand what I mean? I understand what you're saying. And um, the, the, the homosexuality, homosexual behavior is not worse than any other sin. So that's not the point. I, I know you understand that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that I don't know of any other sinful behavior that religious people as well as secular people demand that god must accept that's the point i see yeah i see the putting it well we should accept that immoral behavior unlike they condone they don't they they shun uh, adultery and other obvious things but this one they're trying to make acceptable absolutely that is the point this 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 is open defiance of god's counsel and i don't know of any other sinful behavior that they have done the same thing if you, if you practice bestiality the world would jump at you jump on you if you practice pedophilia that's out they, they would be outraged if you practiced if you practice if you formed a society for fornicators i mean the carnal people would love it but there's no religious person who would condone it and nobody who would say that god would accept that kind of behavior if you formed a society for adulterers nobody would think that god accepts this kind of behavior or would try to suggest it but here is an area where and what is interesting what is interesting to me um since since we are we're talking about this a little bit what is interesting to me is that just like they say homosexual tendencies many people have them from early they even go to say they are they are inborn so they are giving this as a reason why the world must accept it. But at the same time, these same people who are making the statement, they also accept that pedophilia, tendencies to pedophilia are also inborn. The same people, same reasoning. In other words, just like you're born a man loving, uh, having attraction to another man or a woman to a woman, people are born having attraction to little children. If you are going to justify one behavior because you say they are born like this we have to sympathize why do you become outraged at the other and want to lock away people forever because they become involved in it you see so it's neither here nor there but the point i'm making is that the the the, the, the whole problem with this particular thing the, the mark of the beast whatever it is and 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 the thing that causes babylon to fall whatever it is it has to be of such a nature it has to be of such a nature that God forbids it and the world accepts it. It has to be of that nature. Once upon a time, I was very strongly convinced that it would be the Sabbath, the Sabbath Sunday issue, because it's the same principle, okay? What, 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 what we once, what, what I once believed, let me say I, because I'm not sure where everybody is, but what I, I once believed was that the last conflict would be a religious war. It would be war between the Sunday keeping Christians and the Sabbath keeping Christians and the Sunday keeping Christians would persecute Sabbath keepers. And furthermore, the Sunday keeping Christians would have enlisted behind them all the political forces of the world so that all the, all the nations of the world would become Sunday observers, they would become haters of Sabbath, Sabbath, and so it would be Sabbath versus Sunday. 
if you ask me why have I adjusted my thinking I'll tell you it's the reason is because I came to understand that we have mis misinterpreted we have misidentified the beast the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast system not the mark of the woman the beast once you identify the beast things have to change because once upon a time the beast for us was the Roman Catholic Church so it was easy to identify the mark of the beast being Sunday observance Sunday observance is a mark of authority of the Roman Catholic Church and you know the rest of it but once it becomes clear that the, the beast is not the Roman Catholic Church it's political room and political room has never had the, the beast system has never had Sunday observance as its mark and when you look at the Bible, I see that the Bible identifies something else as a mark of, 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 of atheism, the mark of a power that has rejected God. So anyway, from this point, you go to say, well, then it's not a Sabbath Sunday conflict. And furthermore, as you understand righteousness by faith, you begin to understand that many Sunday keeping people are your brothers and sisters. They're your brothers and sisters. They, they may not they may not see. As clearly as you see on some things. Maybe on some things they see better, but they are still children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. The fact that they worship on Sunday does not make them your enemy. The, the, the mark of the beast has to be something that is blatantly and openly wrong. Everybody has to know it is wrong because you cannot be judged for doing something that you, that you don't know is wrong. God cannot blame you if you don't know that it is wrong. So it has to be an issue that everybody knows is right and wrong. And this is why I think that this whole LGBT movement, the way it is sweeping the world, it is an issue that is tailor made for this because everybody knows God's position on these things. And and while the world, it's 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 astonishing that the world should set out to so defy God. It it, it blew my mind when when Obama had the the White House lit up in the rainbow colors, the strongest nation on the earth, the, the mightiest nation, the rainbow colors lit up lit up. The White House. It 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 blew my mind when the the gay flag was 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 raised on every American embassy around the world, including Jamaica. The world is making a statement. They're making a statement to God, and the churches are falling into line. And even in the Adventist Church, they have not officially accepted the gay movement, but there are strong voices in Adventism, strong voices, theologians at Andrews. Um, Loma Linda and the Adventist universities, theologians in the church who are advocating for the church to accept it. Some places they have they have appointed um, gay pastors in California, uh, women to lesbians. They, they they have appointed a transgender elder. They, those things don't just they're not isolated events. In the Adventist it, it, church. In the Adventist church, yes. They, they are steps that are being taken and, and it's a tide that is irresistible. And I'll tell you why the churches cannot resist it, because if it becomes when it becomes, I will say when, when it becomes enough of an issue, you must either accept it or lose your status, lose your right to operate as a church. The steps are simple. They are ABC. When 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 it, it becomes an issue that. It becomes a human rights issue. When it becomes an issue that you cannot discriminate because of sexual orientation. And when you want to become a pastor in the Adventist church or an elder and you're refused the post, and it is suspected or even hinted that it is because you are an LGBT person and you take the church before the Human Rights Commission or whatever else. The church must conform or cease to exist as a church. I'll tell you it's happening, it's 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 coming, and and I can see it very clearly. So anyway, I believe that this is the event that will result in the voice from heaven. And I suspect it's going to be the same event as that is called the abomination of desolation, standing where it ought not. I suspect it's the same event that is going to be referred to as the uh, mark of the beast that will eventually escalate to the point where people will even die because of it but anyway all of that is still 
yet to be seen. And like I say, I'm not hoping to be wrong, but I'm making room that I could be wrong. All right. Um, I just if if I see something that makes more sense, I'm willing to to adjust my thinking. But so far, this seems to fit all the parameters that I can find. So God says, "Come out of her, my people." And He says the reason is, if you stay there, you are going to become partakers of her sins. Why? Because birds of a feather flock together. Because a man is known by the company he keeps. Because Evil communications corrupt good manners. And what the Bible means is bad company spoil you. My mother told me that when I was a boy, bad company will spoil you. Don't keep bad company. And when the church becomes bad company, you better part company with the church because God says what is going to happen next is that you become a partaker of her sins. You can't walk together with her unless you're agreed with her because the, 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 the evil practices and the evil principles rub off on you because you are there because every day you are imbibing it and it begins to affect your thinking without calling any names one of the the, the problems i have with 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 my friends and even relatives who are in the adventist church and other churches you know what they do they make excuse for everything they make excuse for everything the worst atrocities the worst kind of behavior and they make excuse i realize that you know i i, I might have said it here pastors don't criticize their churches doctors don't criticize medical practice lawyers don't criticize legal practice politicians don't 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 criticize politics they they, they stick with the thing where they make their their living once you begin to be critical, you, you separate, you part, or you keep quiet. A lot of our people take the option of keeping quiet. They go there and they keep quiet and they sit there. But I'll tell you, God says there comes a time when if you continue to do that, you are going to partake of her sins and you are going to receive of her plagues. It says, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So, we are looking here at the judgment of Babylon. And um, who is God talking to? He says, reward her even as she rewarded you. I guess he's talking to the church. Double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that God is in the business of personal vengeance. What I mean by this is, you know, in the story I told this morning, I mentioned that um, my wife kind of suggested that we could spray something. She was so upset. She said, we should just spray, spray the rat in its eyes. And I know she didn't mean it because she's not really that way, but it was just an emotional statement and i i i think about it because it's so human it's so human because we humans what what the way we think is like this you made me suffer i want you to suffer in return you made me suffer i want to suffer in return this is human it's not divine because what god can do god can look at something and he can see the reasons. You know that the, the, the rat is the rat because he's born a rat. The rat is not trying to annoy you or upset you because he's nibbling your food and, and he might be, be walking, uh, walking around and ter terrorizing your, your family. He's not trying to do it. He's just being a rat. Okay? And so God knows you are a sinner because you were born into this situation. And and as life life directed you, you made certain choices, bad choices, and you ended up where you are. What does God want? God has tears in his eyes and pain in his heart, and he knows that he has to take you out of the way. But he has no pleasure in it. He has no joy in it. And he's not looking to torture you. So when you look at these statements that say that where God says, reward her just like she rewarded you, double unto her, double. These are these are statements that that have the taint 
of vengeance. They have the taint of retribution. But I'm learning that, I'm learning to look at them in a different way. And I'm seeing that what God is saying is that there's a principle of life and it works in the spiritual realm as well as in the physical realm. And it goes like this. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. And we often interpret this to mean that if you do this, I'm going to do this back to you. But that is not what it means. What God is saying is that there are principles of life that were established when the universe was designed that whatever you do, it has repercussions. Just like if you, if you spit in the sky, it drops in your eye. All right? Nobody spat back in your eye. Your own spittle drops in your eye. Forgive the gross illustration. But that's what God is kind of saying. If you spit in the sky, it drops in your eye. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. Okay? If you are lazy and you don't plant your crops, you're going to be hungry. Why? Somebody come and push hunger on you? No. It's the repercussions of what you do. And it's a law of life. And what God is saying to Babylon here, the same depth to which Babylon has affected people. You see, what has been happening? What, what can we see? What has been happening? Resentment against Babylon has been building up for generations. One of the things you will notice, brothers and sisters, is that there is developing in the world a hatred of Christianity. Mark, mark it. There is developing a hatred of Christianity, and it is not because of true Christians. It's because of Babylonian Christianity, right? People like Kenneth Copeland, some of these men have three private jets, okay? They, 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 have, they have their dog houses are better than the house you live in, okay? And, and when, when they are collecting, they, 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 they send buckets through the congregation. They are multi millionaires some of them are approaching billionaires and they 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 are they deceive the people and they have you know one of one of the jokes was the way they got involved in the last election and if you look at some of the commentaries and the contempt the contempt that people have of of the so called of the so called christian religion resentment has been building for ages and what happens is that when Babylon is judged here. Remember the Bible says it's the ten horns. The ten horns burn her with fire. And what we see here is, is her being burned with fire. Why do the ten horns burn Babylon with fire? It's because the resentment that has been building against religion finally flows over. Remember in the French Revolution. When, when, when when France attacked the Catholic Church and took away all her institutions, took away her churches, slaughtered, I think it was about 70,000 Catholic priests and, and, and church people. They slaughtered about 70,000 of them. That blood ran in the gutters of, of, of France like water, the gutters of the cities like water. They outlawed religion. They made the official state religion atheism. They set up a woman, a, 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 a woman, of, a loose woman, a prostitute, and they paraded her around as the goddess of reason. They gave up religion and they took, they officially became an atheistic nation, the nation of France back in the, in the, in the 17 something. It was the, it was the accumulated resentment of hundreds of years caused by the behavior of the Catholic Church. It finally overflowed. And the same thing is happening, but this time not just in France, it is developing on a global level. This hatred and this resentment and this, this contempt of Christian religion. And so when God says double unto her, double, what he's saying is that what she has planted, she's about to reap and she's about to reap with a vengeance as the saying goes. The, the, the people who are going to turn against her, the, 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 the ten horns, they are going to completely devastate Babylon. That's what I'm, I, I, I see in the prophecy. And that's what I see. That's what I, what I anticipate. And God is describing it like, like you know, he's talking about um, Babylon as if she's a woman. And so he's using 
that kind of language. One of the things we have to do as we are we are going through through this part of Revelation, most of Revelation, is we look at physical descriptions. And we have to translate it into spiritual applications. And, and one of the things is that many times we are not very good at doing this. We have a hard time making the spiritual application. But that's what we have to bear in mind. It's physical descriptions, but we have to think about what is it really saying in a literal sense? What does it really mean practically? How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. So in proportion to how, I mean, when the church started, it was poor, it was pure, and it was persecuted. When the church started, it was no friend of the world. The Caesars and the Herods and the Jewish leaders, they, 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 they tried their best to destroy the Christian church. They, they killed the leaders of the church. They killed the ordinary people. They hunted them like dogs. The church was no queen. The church did not glorify herself or, 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 or treat herself like some special entity. It was poor and persecuted, but it was pure. When the church began to walk with politicians and kings, it morphed into the Roman Catholic system. And she came to the place where she said in her heart, I sit a queen and I'm no widow and shall see no sorrow. This became the attitude of the Christian church. And somehow it never changed because even when you had the Reformation, at first, these Protestant churches were not really very popular, not all of them. In the case of the Anglican church, for example, it was instantly accepted because what the Anglican church did, the King of England simply took away everything from the Roman Catholic church and set up a state religion called the Church of England. A lot of it was still like Catholicism, but they just gave it a different head. Instead of the Pope being the head, the King of England became the head of the church. So that one stepped into religion, dressed in her beautiful garments, dressed up in royal, royal robes from the beginning. But you had some like the, 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 the Wesleyan, the Lutheran, they started out in persecution and hardship, but they, they very shortly became well established and, 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 and popular. And they embraced the hands of the political powers and they rose to the status where all of them, most of them can say, we are royalty. We, we live in the high places of the earth. We feed on the good things of the earth. Like Babylon says here, I sit a queen. I sit a queen and have no widow and shall see no sorrow. Most of these churches take their position in society for granted. For example, how does, how does a church in America, for example, feel? when Joe Biden or, or Obama or anybody takes away some of their, their privileges. Like, like if, if, for example, if, if the government says, we are no longer going to give you your tax exempt status. My goodness, the churches will be outraged. It's our right for the government not to tax us. They are accustomed to privilege. What do you think the early church would have said? If the government says you have to be taxed, they, 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 could they have complained? As a matter of fact, just to be recognized by the government, the early church would have felt extremely privileged because not only could, were they, were they, could they never have a tax exempt status, they could not even have the, the status of being allowed to function. Rendered to Caesar, Caesar. Yes, they rendered to Caesar the things that were Caesar's and to God the things that were God. But what I'm saying is that the church today, when you hear them talk, they are, every little thing that happens in Jamaica here, they're on TV giving their opinion. And, 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 and people are, are saying the church, what is the church doing? We know that they, the Lions Club is doing this, the, 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 the Kiwanis is doing this. What is the church doing? What, what, where's the voice of the church in all of this? So they have become elite walking up there in the high places of the earth and they expect this to continue forever and that is why this is why she has this high expectation i shall see no sorrow 
And so God makes, makes, makes us know. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And God's involvement in this is that God, God allows the forces of God allows the forces of the beast to be released on this woman. God's restraining hands. Because remember in Revelation chapter 6, chapter 7. In the first verse, it says that there are four angels and they were holding back the winds. They were holding back the winds that the wind should not blow on the earth. God is no longer holding back those winds. There's no longer any protection for Babylon. And so Babylon is utterly devastated. She shall be utterly burned with fire. For a strong God has judged her and he has left her to her judgment. It says, utterly, say that again. Just utterly. Yes. The word utterly means completely. Okay, so there will be nothing left of God then. I think I think um, this is the same thing that happens in in Revelation 16 when it says uh, Babylon was divided into the great city was divided into three parts. After this, after the, I th this is the end of Babylon. This is the end of Babylon. Remember, this happens after the beast has come into power. I believe this happens after the close of probation and after um, the ten horns have come to power. Because up to this point, Babylon is still very influential in the world. Up to this point, they still have a lot of clout and a lot of influence with the governments. But what we see is that when the beast becomes king number eight, as we have pointed out over and over, this king number eight is a power that is without any religious influence, or at least it is without any Christian religious influence. Let me put it that way. I believe it's going to be no religious influence. It's going to be an anti-God element, but it may be that there is some pagan element. I don't know. I can't say clearly on that matter, but I know that this, this beast and the ten horns will hate religion because they hate the woman and they hate true Christianity. They, they destroy the woman and they try to destroy God's people as well. So it's a non-Christian. It's, it's, this is why the beast is said to be from the bottomless pit. It's from a completely godless environment. So you have to, you have to look at, um, so the beast destroys the woman. And what, I, what it means is that we have come to the place where the world has officially turned against God entirely. This is what I believe the last conflict is. Not a conflict between Christian versus Christian. There are three powers, three major elements at the end of time. And they are the same three elements that were there at the destruction of Jerusalem. There are always these three elements. There, there, there is the the power of the beast, the political power, the secular power. There is a false religious system in the time of Jesus. That was the Jewish church. And there are God's people, which is the true Christians. These three elements and the same three elements exist at the end. You have the false religious system, Babylon. You have God's people, which, are, which, which is God's true people. And you also have the beast power. And it happened in the past. It happens again. The, the political system turns against the beast, uh, uh, turns against the false religious system and destroys her. While God's people, God saves them, God preserves them. Same thing happens at the end. But there's a hatred of Christianity, a hatred of God's religion. So they, they turn against religion. Right now, I keep saying it. I have these forebodings. Their Christianity is so disgraced, so disgraced in the world today. You have so many, so many tricksters, so many people claiming to be Christians. They are, they are nothing but what we call in Jamaica, jinnals. They are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are fakers. They are pretenders. They are only out there to get money out of people or to deceive people. They are open tricksters. I can't think of the appropriate word I'm looking for. 
They're open tricksters and all they want is to take advantage of people. And there is a breeding resentment. The average person on the street thinks that all Christianity is for is to deceive people and milk them of their, of their, of their money. That's the average person out there. That's what they think. They think it's just a system that is there to milk money out of people. I, I feel a lot of distress when I, when I think about it because it is my God and the name of God. But I realize that you can't get away from it because a lot of it is true. There are people out there. Every time there is a, is a pastor that is found, a priest that is found molesting little boys, or a pastor that is caught having sexual relations with a, with a young girl or something, it's in the forefront of the papers. Big news. They don't tell you if somebody is converted or becomes a Christian. They don't, they, don't, they don't publicize it if Christians do something good. But if there's something evil that happens, oh, they broadcast it. And they make sure it's there in the public. And people come to despise Christianity. It's a growing sentiment. And it finally breaks out in this last moment. And Brother David, I think it is important that um, we know that, the, that Babylon is totally destroyed. And even in chapter 19, the saints are actually praising God and rejoicing about her smoke. Is that, on the other hand, the beast continues until the coming of Christ. Absolutely. So to make a clear distinction between the entity called Babylon and the beast. Right, Babylon is destroyed at this point, but the beast remains. The beast destroys Babylon. And when Jesus is coming again in Revelation 19, verses 18 and 19, you see that the beast is there with the false prophet gathered together to make war against Christ. But by this time, Babylon is gone. So there's a clear distinction between Babylon and the beast. Now, we have a picture here in the next few verses of the kings of the earth mourning and wailing and so on. And I, I, again, what we have to understand is that this is a symbolic picture, right? What happened when ancient Babylon was overthrown? I suppose she had friends who, who bemoaned her existence. As a matter of fact, I think, I think some of these statements here, you can actually find. Um, it's actually, they're actually um, statements from the book of Revelation uh, from Ezekiel. Let me see if I can find one in Ezekiel. Here's a statement in Ezekiel that talks about the um, destruction of ancient ancient Tyre. Tyrus. Then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones and lay away their robes and put off their broidered garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling. They shall sit upon the ground and shall tremble at every moment and be astonished at thee. So you have you have a similar the language we see in revelation is a reflection or a not reflection i'm thinking of it's it's an expression it's it you could almost say it's borrowed from the old testament i'm not saying that john borrowed it i'm saying that god so designs it that it, it it's it's a reflection of what was said in the in the old testament about the destruction of ancient babylon if you go back through the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and you look at the destruction of ancient Babylon, it's the same kind of language that is being used here in um, Revelation. In other words, as I've pointed out before, when you look at some of these prophecies, you are not looking at the details of the prophecy. What you are looking at is the overall idea that God is trying to give you. God is trying to give you a picture of what happened with ancient, with the destruction of ancient Babylon. And he's showing you that this is a, a revisitation of the same event. So, for example, it says, look at what it says. Let me give you an example. In verse 19, it says, and they cast dust on their heads. Does anybody think that will really happen? You think anybody is going to see, even if it were a, a city or a church, you think anybody is going to throw dust on their head and cry over the destruction of this city or this church or this organization, whatever it is? No. What God is doing is giving you a picture of what happens 
in ancient times when some great destruction took place. This is the kind of response that you would have. So God is showing us how devastating and how great will be the destruction of Babylon. If you look at what he says in verse 16, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Was this literally true of any city? Do you know any city that they, they take fine cloth and cover it, purple and scarlet cloth? Do you know any church or any in, a religious institution that actually is, is, is clothed with linen, purple, scarlet, and decked with gold, precious stones? No, God is looking at Babylon as a woman. And he's describing her as a woman and he's using the imagery that you would associate with a woman. She's, she's, she has on fine clothing. She has jewelry. She's wearing jewelry and she is destroyed. And when she's destroyed, everybody comes around and they start to cry and they start to mention the things that she used to do and how they used to be profitable from her. And so it's a, it's a picture of destruction. I'm not going to go through the, these verses in detail because, to be honest, I think that if you try to interpret these verses word for word, we're going to end up with confusion. What I'm going to do, because my time is up, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read through, I'm just going to read through these verses and um, we can get the, the overall picture. But what we are looking at is the destruction of Babylon by the ten horns, by the beast. And the final destruction of Babylon. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Is this literal smoke, literal burning? I don't think so. I don't think it's a literal burning. I don't think somebody is going to loot a city like they looted in the, in the ancient times, like they looted literal Babylon. No. What we are looking at is figurative language and we are to, we are to understand the implications instead of the details. Standing afar off for fear of her torment. This suggests that people are actually seeing this. Like you'd be standing on the sea or you'd be standing somewhere and you see the smoke of a city going up. Again, it's clear, it's clear to me that this is figurative. Saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And again, you can think, is there any place on earth where all the merchandise was going? There, there is a system of merchandise. There is a system of, 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 of trade. And somewhere behind the system were, were, was this religious institution, this many-sided, many-faceted religious institution. It was, it was in the background of all that was taking place. And when this system goes down, the, 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 the trade system, the trading system, falls apart. The merchandise of gold and silver, precious stone, pearls, fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet, and thine wood, certainly that's not literal. Vessels of ivory, that's not literal. Vessels of most precious wood, brass, iron and marble. It's Old Testament imagery. Cinnamon, odors, ointment, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, beef, sheep, horses, chariots and slaves and souls of men. It's Old Testament imagery. These are the things that were high merchandise back in, in, in the Old Testament time. And the, fruits of, and the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and good and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Anyway. I'm going to skip down and just come down to the last few verses because I don't want to come back to this next week. But, uh, David. Yes, Brother Ian. Uh, so, wouldn't you say that, that all of that merchandise and stuff is really indicative of the kind of interaction that the false Christianity has with the world in terms of trade? Actual trade? Absolutely. I believe that. I believe that okay. it's talking about the kind of a fornication, kind of fornicating relationship that the church has had with the world. The church has become involved. When I say the church, I speak advisedly. I mean the religious systems, right? They have become involved in things that had no business 
God's people had no business to be involved in it. They have become involved in the merchandise system, the mercantile system of the world. That has become their main, their, they have become so involved that the entire system is wrapped up in Babylon. And when Babylon goes down, the system goes down. That's what they are mourning about because you can imagine, I mean, if they, some of them have the power, some of these institutions are actually behind or have the power behind some of these huge banks that can move the entire financial system of the world. When something goes down, like some of these banks went down in 2008, you know how it shocked the world. But apparently, this fall of Babylon will be an even greater shock to the financial system. Um, Brother David. Brother David. Yes, Brother Sean. Uh, yeah, um, why would the kings of the earth lament, given that they're, lament over her, given that they're the one who um, would have destroyed her? Um, the, 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 the destroyers of Babylon are the ten kings, the ten horns, okay? So, what, what, this is why I emphasize that what we are looking at is a, uh, is a, is a, it's a panoramic picture rather than the details of the picture because in, in every situation like this, you have some people who regret because they recognize that their benefits are going to be gone. But you also have those who say it is time and we are fed up of this system, it's time that it goes. So God is giving us two sides of one picture. On the one hand, people come to hate Babylon and they are, they want to get rid of her. On the other, on the other hand, there is regret that's, that many of the benefits that she brought are gone. So God is giving us these two pictures by using graphic language. But like I said, the language is taken straight from the Old Testament. These are the things that are said about the destruction of Babylon, the destruction of Tyre back in the Old Testament. These are the, this is the same kind of language. So God is simply borrowing the language from the Old Testament and giving it to us so we can get the picture of the complete destruction and the way it is affecting the world. This is my understanding of it. So, the angel takes up a, great, a stone like a great millstone and he casts it into the sea saying, thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So it's the end of Babylon. It is never to recover. And we know it is true because it's the end of time. The voice of harpers, musicians, pipers, trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be found anymore in thee. No more merchandise, no more any of these things. Light of a candle, no more. The voice of the bridegroom and of the bride, no more. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And verse 24 is another striking verse because it says, in her, whatever Babylon is, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Where can we go to find that? Where can we go to find a place where everybody that was ever killed on earth, all of God's people, were killed at that spot. That's another strong statement because there's no one city in the world, literal city, that you can you can blame for this. You can't say all of God's people were killed in the Vatican or were killed at Rome. You can't say they were killed in New York. You can't say they were killed in London. There's no one city in the world, literal city, that you can say every child of God who ever died was dead here. But if you go to the Bible, you can see the precedence for this because Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that, that, that institution. He says, you are guilty of all the blood that was slain upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barakias, whom you slew between the porch and the altar. All the blood that was ever slain was found in Jerusalem. In what sense? Certainly, even before Jerusalem was, was, was existed, the blood of Abel was, was, was shed. And God says that blood, Jesus says that blood, Jerusalem was guilty of it. What Jesus was doing and what we should be doing in a greater sense, in a, in, in a greater understanding, what he was doing was looking at the principle behind. He was looking at the spirit that was manifested and he was saying, this is the same spirit that killed Abel, that killed Isaiah, that killed Jeremiah, that killed 
this institution is the same Babylon from the beginning of the world because it's the same spirit. He's identifying Babylon by the spirit that existed in the institution and not by the location. If you understand what I'm saying, he was saying Jerusalem was guilty of the blood of the prophets because the same spirit passed from, from those former persecutors down through the ages and now existed in the people who killed Jesus, in the institution that crucified Jesus. And so the same principle applies here. What is Babylon? It's the same spirit that existed through the ages in all these institutions now existing in Neo-Babylon, modern Babylon, new Babylon, the same spirit. So new Babylon is wherever this spirit exists and wherever this spirit has resulted in the death of God's people, there is modern Babylon. There is the Babylon of today, the same spirit. In Revelation, we are identifying institutions by the spirit that they possess. You say this is true of the church, we have to apply it universally. God's people are not a physical institution. God's people are not a denomination. We are not the Adventist church or the Catholic church or the Baptist church. God's people are those who possess the spirit of the living God. The enemy of God's people is Babylon. It's those who possess the same spirit that persecuted and killed God's people throughout the ages. This is Babylon. This is the Babylon of the new new of the new times the babylon of the the, the the final babylon that ultimately is destroyed in this last moment so anyway right david yes but i i um at the end of verse 23 he said by her sorceries she deceived the world uh, can you say a word about that Again, I, I, I'm thinking about it for the first time because I never thought of it till you mentioned it, but just thinking about it superficially. But I, I, what I would say is that sorcery is, is, is the use of deception. It's, the, it's a claim, a lot of sorcery is based on sleight of hand, it's based on deceptiveness. Some of it is based on interaction with evil spirits, I grant you. But the way the, the word seems to be um, used in the book of Revelation, it refers to using deceptive methods to mislead people. And so I, I would apply it the same way here. And I would say that Babylon has misled the entire world by, by false ideas, by deception. She has been guilty of the darkness that exists in the world. So I, I think just on the surface of it, without thinking too deeply about it, that's how I would understand it. You don't think that he was making any kind of reference to the Greek word uh, pharmakia? It's worth thinking about. I was about to ask that. It, it, it's worth thinking about. All right, but the thing is, I, I would say if you if you say through this we mean the use of drugs and 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 and, and you know drug type of medicine, you would ask. How does this result in the deception of the whole world? Because I don't think the world is going to be deceived so much by the use of drugs as by false doctrine. So I, I wouldn't want to interpret it that way because then you become focused on some physical element as a, as a key rather than spiritual uh, mis misleading deception. So, so I, I, Yes, Brother Matt. I think uh, it's it's important to note that um, big pharma is what they call them, right? This industry is got to be the, the biggest money-making industry on this planet. I mean, trillions of dollars pass through these companies. Um, and I would even consider that that these would be considered maybe a king of uh, one of the 10 kings, you know? They have so much power and influence over the economy. And there's such a big part of this great reset that's about to take place or taking place. Um, it's incredible. Yeah, what, what I would say is that we, we would need to find some way to identify them with Babylon. You know, and that, that's where the challenge is. How, do we, how would we identify the pharma, pharmacological companies 
as Babylon. You know, even though we understand them and the banking system and the influence that they have, but um, I don't know of any strong connection between them and the religious institutions more than anything else. You know, so while I while, while I agree that the the the, far, the the influence of drugs and and all of that has a very negative influence, but I I to put it in the prophecy as one of the major elements, I'd have to. A, a little more evidence before I would look at. I, I would. Uh, um, I would say that. You know? Brother David, can I say something? Sure, brother. Brother Ray, go ahead. I, I believe um, that if if let us say you put pharmaceutical things and drugs and, and all this stuff, the bottom line is whatever is coming. Whoever Bob Babylon is, he is in control as in one entity. Just not the drugs alone are gonna be. You know uh involved and not the uh, homosexual alone it's going to be one power that's going to subdue everyone to do whatever it wants it to do as a government and that's always been worse from the beginning of time that, that's my belief okay i mean it, it, it's it's the, the more we see what is happening the more we we tend to suspect that um we tend to ask ourselves a question will there be some physical component connected with the mark of the beast. Like for example, I know a lot of us are thinking about this vaccine and wondering if it will affect our minds or whether or not there will be something connected to it that will require us to hold to some spiritual belief that is connected to the receiving of the vaccine. I mean, the, the, the one thing we know is that whatever happens is going to surprise us because I'm sure Satan understands all our preconceived ideas and he's planning ways to surprise us. But ultimately, here's what I would be I would feel very confident about. I'm confident that God, that is going to be primarily a matter of our spiritual choices. I'm confident about this because if 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 it is something where somebody can physically hold you and compel you to do something, then you have no power of choice. How can you be judged for this? The mark of the beast is to divide the world into two camps, those who are loyal to God and those who are not. Mark that. It has to be, it has to be something where people are free to voluntarily choose because if you don't voluntarily choose, how can it be a way of judging the world? So we have to remember that the main point behind the mark of the beast, it's a moment of judgment for the world. The hour of his judgment has come. People are to be judged and they are to be judged on the basis of their choice. You are going to choose who you belong to, who you respect, who you honor. If you don't have the power to choose, it's pointless. So I believe fully, fully that when the mark of the beast comes, whatever it is, this must be preserved, your power to choose. There's going to be pressure. There's going to be death threats, but you will be free to choose. You're, you're, you're not going to have your, your, your thinking so confused and so disoriented that you are not able to choose properly. That is a must. Otherwise, the whole mark of the beast situation, it's a it's a failure. God, 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 God's intent in allowing it would have failed. So so that's my 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 thought on that. Anyway, um it's time for me to stop. My voice is saying that, and I know I don't want to wear out everybody. So I want to appreciate. I want to appreciate your, your input, everyone, and I want to appreciate um, your attentiveness. I'm going to close as soon as Brother Aon makes his point. I'm going to close, and then we can discuss afterwards if we have to. Okay, I just, I just want to say that I think the sorceries that Babylon has, has um, work on people or the nations is, is, is probably connected to the, the merchandising and everything that else that she does with the kings of the earth. I think that's what Brother Matt was alluding to, that even even though it is not something that will affect our choice, but the way how Babylon uses the merchand the merchandising with the kings of the world and so forth, the way it's mixed up that way, it helps to to kind of you know get people into the position where they could deceive them. Not necessarily that it affects their choice. Okay. So I mean if you put the pharmaceutical company inside of it. Is part of the big merchandising of the entire world that is going on between. 
Okay, so what what you what you are saying is so that instead, uh, if the people begin to make their choices from early on, when they begin to put their loyalty between behind these these uh, man-made solutions, something like that. Right. And you then the ultimate choice watch. becomes easier because they've already taken this step. Yes, I, I, I could see right. that. That's right. So they get the, the mark in their hands or the, the, the economical system is, is pressuring and putting people in such a position that they are more poised to go along with whatever Babylon is or whatever the beast is coming up with. All of these things is in that direction because of the economical structure that is out there. You made a point earlier that when the church started, it started out poor, but it was pure. Wealth and affluence in the church is not something that is good. Right. Not a good sign. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to pray. And like I said, um, okay, there's something else I should say, but after I, I, I pray.